Okay, a very warm welcome to everyone this evening. Everyone who's in the live Zoom room with us, as well as those who are following us on the YouTube channel. We're really delighted to launch this evening a new online talk series at Mind and Life Europe, showcasing some of the cutting edge research that has come out of our European Varela Awards program. And so each month we'll feature an alumna or alumnus of the EVA Awards program, and we'll hear from them about their specific research outcomes, as well as their broader journey into the world of contemplative science. And so this is really important for us at MOE as it's part of our mission to disseminate the fruits of contemplative research to a wider audience, and also to create a sense of community for the next generation of contemplative researchers. So thank you so much for joining us for this first uh, inaugural session of the series. And for the inaugural session, we are really pleased to have Dr. Teria Sparby with us this evening. We'll be speaking to us about his research project um, when he was awarded the EVA in 2014. So he was actually part of the first cohort. So he'll be speaking about first person methods in contemplative science, microphenomenology, anthroposophy, and the stages of meditation. So Teria Sparby is a philosopher and meditation researcher. His main areas of research are German idealism, consciousness, and first person methods. He studied philosophy at the University of Oslo and received his PhD in philosophy at Heidelberg University in 2012 on the topic of Hegel's conception of the determinant negation. He has been a postdoc at Humboldt University and the Bender Institute of Neuroimaging, and he's also been a visiting scholar at the Mind and Life Institute and collaborated with researchers as part of the Varieties of Contemplative Experience project. And currently, he's a professor of philosophy at the Steiner University College in Oslo, where he's joining us uh, this evening. So thank you so much, Terya, for offering your time and for getting us uh, launched in this new series. And so the floor is yours for the presentation. All right, thank you very much, Joanna, and to everyone who's present. Um, this is um, quite, for me, a quite uh, an exciting talk. I've been sort of um, trying to draw together a lot of different research threads over the last few years, last 10, maybe even 20 years. Um, so it's kind of a broad perspective on the things I've been doing. And uh, um, I'll also be going a bit at least into uh, what I did with the Varela Award uh, that I got then in 2014. Uh, that's actually work that's still still being published um, as, as I'll show you soon. So I'll start to start to share my screen. Let's see. Uh, so. You can see that good. So again, the title is first person methods in contemplative science. And you might notice that I'll be talking about anthroposophy first and then going to microphenomenology and the stages of, stages of meditation. That's a more uh, logical progression. And anthroposophy was also what I was working on um, in, in the context of the Varela Award. Um, and it's a topic that's familiar to few people, but not everyone. And it's a big and complex topic, uh, but I'll still, I'll try to outline it. Um, and we have some time also afterwards to go into whatever interests you basically, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do some broad strokes here. Um, so we need to go to this, Guy Rudolf Steiner was the founder of anthropos uh, anthroposophy, which um, can be defined as a, a spiritual movement um, and draws on numerous different sources German idealism, Goethe, Christian mysticism, European esotericism, theosophy, uh, Nietzsche, and naturalism. So uh, that's, that's quite a lot. Um, and again, I won't be able to, to unpack that. Um, just to give an indication of where this is coming from. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and <clears throat> what it results in um, 
or what it's based on, I should say, is a kind of spiritual practice uh, that has an emphasis on ethical individualism, thinking, imagination, an idea of spiritual perception of the self, the higher self, and higher worlds, and nature. So in a sense, pretty radically spiritual, I guess you could say. Um, and what's unique, I think you could say, is uh, that it's had some social social impact, um, different cultural initiatives growing out of, out of it, such as world of pedagogy, anthroposophic medicine, Eurythmy, Eurythmy, movement art form, I guess you could say, and biodynamic farming. Um, and that's, to some extent, the context that I'm working in now, which is Steiner pedagogy. Uh, some might know that uh, it's an, an alternative pedagogy widespread all over the world with more than a thousand schools. So uh, quite, quite influential. Um, yeah, and... So what's special to it also is that it has this spiritual foundation. Uh, and you could call that a form of higher knowledge, um, which is a central part of European intellectual history, going back to Plato, you know, the idea of um, uh, the forms behind appearances that you, through thinking, through spiritual practice, can get in touch with. And there are different iterations of this idea throughout uh, European intellectual history. And I can't really go into that. It's an interesting topic, um, but I'll try to um, see. Yeah, give you a, a sort of an overview of, of where Steiner wants to go to. And <clears throat> he starts with this idea uh, that you find in German idealism, that there are higher forms of knowledge, sometimes called intellectual intuition, uh, intellectual uh, understanding, which is a way of, again, going to the forms behind appearances. And uh, what's also kind of unique, unique to it is that uh, he tries to relate that to nature. Um, so you get a kind of spiritual understanding of, of nature as well. Uh, and I've tried to summarize all of that in this figure. So this is an overview of anthroposophy. Um, <clears throat> and it is this idea that there is a kind of spiritual origin to um, the world, to human beings, and there's this great evolution leading up to the human being. And that's also a kind of distancing from the source. But then through meditation, it is possible to gain some kind of access to a spiritual form of perception of a spiritual world, which you'll see there. And when you do that, you also see um, sort of the spiritual foundation of the manifest world of nature and so on. And this then becomes the foundation for social renewal. So there is a kind of gesture we've been uh, exiting sort of the origins, and then you reconnect to the origin, and then you go back into the world to, you know, make it better. So there's an ascent uh, and a descent that follows that, which again, I think is, is pretty unique in that it has been socially influential as well. The thing is that um, if you look to the history of anthroposophy, you get a picture that's something like this. So this idea of spiritual evolution leading up to the human being kind of remains a narrative in Steiner's work, but it hasn't been you know, investigated at all within the academic world and so on. And you get um, a relation to nature, for instance, in Wolof pedagogy, there's an emphasis on that. And you have the institutions that are existing such as the Steiner schools. But again, the meditation practice has definitely remained in the background. There hasn't been any previous research on that. And also the whole idea of there being a spiritual background to the manifest world, again, remains a picture you get from Steiner, but um, it's not part of what you'd find, uh, you know, in the general uh, academic uh, environment. Um, and 
this was definitely something that Steiner was after. He speaks about this seelische Beobachtung nach naturwissenschaftlicher Methode. That's the subtitle of his uh, philosophy of freedom. Translation, spiritual perception model after the method of natural science. So there is this idea that um, gaining an access to the spiritual world isn't something that needs to be faith-based. It can be experiential, it can be systematic. And um, there are meditation methods to open up that access. And you need to kind of model that on the development that's been happening within uh, natural sciences as well. And if you go to the quote below there, um, you find something that Steiner said in Riddles of the Soul. So what, um, well, everyone takes that, everyone that takes an anthroposophic perspective yearns after working in a real psychological laboratory. So I think in a way that was the hope, uh, the intention of establishing a kind of laboratory that goes into this uh, whole thing, you know, that's kind of hasn't been developed. So uh, using meditation to open up spiritual perception, to do research on the foundation of the manifest world uh, in a way that can be inspiring for social renewal and so on. And, you know, before starting this research, research I found that idea very appealing, um, but didn't have any sense that, you know, to what extent are people even doing these kinds of practices? Are there anything that the anthroposophic meditators can speak of? And that's sort of the basic research question that I had going into this. And this is an overview of the different studies on anthroposophic meditation, the ones in red contain data from the Varela uh, project. And so you can see there's actually one that's still forthcoming. So I'm still using this data. Um, and I did one in 2018, looking for or into motivations for med uh, anthroposophic meditation, what people who meditate according to the two Steiner's uh, methods say about why they do it. Um, and then I did also one study of different anthroposophic practices, mantra practice, uh, and then one in 2020, where I tried to systematize the whole sort of range of experiences that people were talking about, changes to the self, uh, changes in emotion, changes in daily life, and so on, trying to um, also get a sense of, is there anything like what Steiner was talking about that's that people are actually experiencing. And it turns out that, um, well, first of all, it's definitely been in the background of this movement. And there has been this general sense that you don't really, you shouldn't really maybe talk about your meditation experiences. So this is definitely hard to even know whether you're progressing, whether what you're experiences, experiencing, if you're experiencing anything compares to other people's experiences. You get this in different meditation communities. There has been this tradition of actually keeping these things for yourself uh, for different reasons that I'm not going to go into now. Um, but that has been the case also within the anthroposophic movement. There has also been uh, some attempts of opening up and starting to talk about meditation experiences. But what typically happens is that it's hard to integrate within the environment. Uh, you can get sort of into a role of being a controversial figure, maybe challenging sort of the traditional views. Um, and nothing has really happened uh, if you go to, for instance, uh, mindfulness research, meditation research in the academic setting, there hasn't been any interaction at all there. So um, to a large extent, then this is an unrealized project. There are things you can point to, deep experiences happening um, that go in the direction of what Steiner is, is, is saying, um, but it tends to be more rare than a common occurrence. That's my impression at least. And again, uh, these experiences remain mostly personal. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at now. This idea of a spiritual lab, researching spiritual experiences, so on, that hasn't happened. And the whole idea of uh, spiritual perception remains questionable. And 
that means that anthropos anthroposophy and I'd say also the institutions connected to it, well, they are socially influential, but you know, is it really a spiritual movement if the foundation isn't really being researched in the way it was intended? So that's kind of my, my summary of that um, research. So yes, people are having experiences. There, there is a tendency to open up about it, but the idea of integrating it um, within the anthroposophic community itself and academic research, that really isn't happening. Again, so the foundations of you know, the whole project as Steiner envisioned it, it isn't really there. Um, but I, on the other hand, you, can, you can, can say that these institutions are alive and they are functioning, but they have to sort of seek different forms of, of justification and uh, so on. So <clears throat> then my next question would be, so where do we go from here? Um, so I think like there is the issue of how the anthroposophic movement deals with this issue. Uh, and that's something I'm going to leave aside for now. I'm going to point to a few things that remain inspiring to me and has kind of guided my future or what I've done uh, actually in parallel uh, to my research on, on anthroposophy and anthroposophic meditation. So this idea of involving oneself fully as a human being um, in the divine in the search for the divine as a thinking human being, I think, think remains uh, important, valuable. If you don't do that, you easily get into the split of, you know, being a meditation pract practitioner on the one side and a scientist on the other side, you know, and this idea that it is possible to have an experience of the divine, of the highest, of the most valuable, of the source of being, you know, uh, Again, in a sense, that's beyond faith and it's an experience. So you can potentially do research on it. I think that's that that remains, at least for me, a very sort of potent, potent idea. And also the idea of retaining the systematicity of natural sciences in relation to spiritual experience. I'm all, all for that. And finally, this notion of knowledge as a spiritual practice. Uh, if you go back to Greek philosophy, that's definitely, you know, part of it. Um, and this was, I guess, uh, an important decision for me also um, as a meditation practitioner, you know, figuring out whether I'm going to do academic research. Do I need to make a decision? You know, in a way, yes, it kind of seems like it. Um, not supposed to talk about your experiences so how sh can you then you know do research on this but again um there there is something about knowledge in both traditions you know within science and within the spiritual traditions that's actually uh, go go well together um and you find out about anthroposophy and that's definitely been sort of a guiding star for for my uh, uh subsequent work so that's where I'm going to leave anthroposophy. That's the first part of my, my presentation now. And I think we'll go, go, go back to that also towards the end. Um, the next is first person methods. So I first need to make a distinction between broad and narrow first person methods. So the broad um, definition would be all research involving first person experience. So that would include also all kinds of qualitative work where you interview people about their experiences. And that's not really what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on first person methods in a narrow sense, which is first person experience studied by the person who has the experience. So you're basically studying your own experience. And, you know, as psychology specifically has developed, this isn't really the, a thing, but as a philosopher, it's the most natural thing I'd say, you know, coming up with thoughts and studying those thoughts. Um, and again, there's this background ins inspiration from, from anthroposophy leading that. And that has been kind of <laughs> nice to have something like that, because if you go to psychology as it's practiced today, um, that project of studying your own experience hasn't really been, been viable. I'm just trying to look at the time. Um, can just, just give me a few seconds. I have to figure out. Oh, I'm looking. Can can anyone give me the time? Is it? 
621. You're great. Yeah. Anymore. Right. Okay. So then beginnings of psychology, there was this discussion about imageless thought. So about 100, 120 years ago, um, people were discussing the potential of kind of setting up, again, as Steiner uh, was indicating, a psychological uh, uh, lab where you do systematic study on, on experiences. And um, there was some initial, I guess you could call it success, but it quickly uh, uh, disintegrated because of this question about imageless thought, whether that's possible. So if you had a psychology, uh, psychologist, um, Wun, and Wundt, William Wundt, and his, actually his, his, his students um, that turned into the so-called Würzburg uh, school. And they ended up discussing this question, whether you can have thoughts uh, without images or language, you know, um, at the same time, uh, or you can kind of state in a different way, saying that or asking whether there is some kind of you know sensation that's the basis of thought or wh whether you can actually have for instance the experience of a thought as such beyond sensations and they couldn't solve this you know they went back and forth uh, about this and that led up to a to a reaction um you find this in uh, an influential uh, article by watson uh also called uh, Behaviorist Manifesto. And he says that psychology as it's generally thought of as something esoteric in its methods. If you fail to reproduce my findings, it's not due to some fault in your apparatus or in the control of your stimulus, but it is due to the fact that your introspection is untrained. The attack is made upon the observer and not upon the experimental setting. So the, the idea is that if you get different results than me, I attack your introspective training. You're not accurate enough, not enough in your reporting, and you know there wasn't any. Uh, they didn't manage to agree upon like a common practice, so the idea was to just then leave that aside and figure out a different way of doing psychology. So we'll look at human behavior, and that's accessible to everyone, and we can forget sort of about the inner life the psyche, was then in a way you know um, thrown out of psychology. And that has remained very much an influential view. And there have been important influential psychological studies just kind of confirming that or uh, providing more arguments for that. Um, here's the classic study where uh, uh, Nisbet and Wilson argue that first person reports aren't reliable. So if they aren't reliable, you can't really have a first-person experience. And there are numerous studies like this showing how unreliable first-person experience or reporting on first-person experience is. And that has kind of undermined the whole project of a systematic first-person uh, science. There has been you know, some attempts or traditions that have been alive, so, such as uh, Husserl and phenomenology, um, I'm not going to go too much into this, but the idea is that uh, you study consciousness systematically through different methods. Uh, for instance, the epoche, where you bracket the whole idea of whether or not things are existing and try to go to the experience as such. Um, finding the essence of consciousness, which would make this also a science. Uh, and as Varela, Thompson, and Roche pointed out, this is a pretty influential book, probably many of you know it, The Embodied Mind, 991. They kind of criticized this idea or pointed out a specific lack in the Australian phenomenological project. Um, indeed, it has been the headache of later commentators to find out just exactly how this method of phenomenological reduction, epoche, is to proceed. Okay, so the next uh, quote. But there's a deep reason for the failure of the Husserlian project that we um, wish to emphasize here. Husserl's turn towards experience and the things themselves was entirely theoretical. 
or to make the point the other way around, which completely lacked any pragmatic dimension. So summarize, we are still in need of a method. And this is just one story. There are some other first person methods that have kind of been alive. Um, and I think maybe around 20 years ago, there was this shift where suddenly for reasons that I'll go into, the kind of the whole atmosphere changed a bit. And this is where I get to microphonology, developed by Claire Petit-Manja, French uh, philosopher. And she did a range of theoretical paper on this idea of studying um, human experience systematically also from the first person perspective. And this is a definition of microphonology from a recent paper. This method enables the researcher to collect descriptions of a, a high level of reliability and a fine degree of granularity, the microdynamics of singular experiences in their pre-reflective dimension. So it's a mouthful. Um, but sort of very specific claims about how you can study experience systematically, making it more reliable, a uh, high degree of granularity. You focus on singular experiences and their microdynamics, and you do that in a pre-reflected dimension, which means basically it's uh, before you have the, the experience before you have theorized about it. Um, <clears throat> And the, so this becomes then a specific, you could say in a sense, empirical method uh, as specific steps where you go into an agreement about studying a specific experience. You use specific techniques for evoking experiences using, for instance, concrete memories, uh, consciously go into the first person perspective and you gather or, or guide descriptions of diachronic and synchronic experiential dimensions, which is basically ex the experience as it unfolds in time and the sort of the deeper dimensions, the synchronic dimensions going on in parallel. And there are specific techniques also for avoiding theorizing about experiencing uh, experiences, this, avoiding so-called satellite dimensions, um, and you use also specific th techniques like reformulating descriptions, mirroring gestures to uh, give people, participants, the, uh, the possibility of correcting their own descriptions. And if the experience as it is drifts into the background, you use techniques for re-evoking re um, your access to that experience. And you have a range of also specific ways of questioning. For instance, if somebody says that they have an experience of a, a certain feeling, you would ask, how do you know that you experienced that feeling? And in that way, you kind of unpack the different pre-reflective aspects of, of experience. And I think there was this milestone study that I'm going to go, go just going to outline it. Um, since I don't have that much time, I think I'll do that uh, quickly. So here's another example of a psychological study undermining the reliability of first-person experiences. There's a specific experimental setup where you can basically trick people into reporting about experiences that they haven't had. And they do that in a way that's quite astonishing. Uh, it's about selecting a specific face, whether you like it or not, and through this trick you're presented with a choice you didn't make. And 80% of the people immediately start to justify why they made a choice they actually didn't make. So that's one way of, 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 of doing this kind of, you know, psychological experiments that again undermines first person reliability. And what Claire Petit-Mangin and colleagues did was to repeat this experience, experiment, adding microphenomenology, um, and that resulted in 80% um, of the people actually realizing that there has been a trick here. So this was a very sort of hard hitting way of showing that through a specific form of training, you can get much more reliable reporting. And this is with also with untrained people, you know, microphonology works mostly with untrained people. Um, through the specific form of questioning, you can then show that they get much more uh, reliable when it comes to reporting. 
So again, very influential, uh, very important, I also think, because you kind of use the methods of conventional psychology for showing that, well, actually there's something we can, we can do here when it comes to first person reports. And this has resulted in uh, an opening of the whole field of microphonology. There's been 100, last time I checked, uh, 100 plus studies, could be 200 now, I'm not, uh, haven't counted recently, in a lot of different domains, um, clinical and therapeutic studies, cognitive science, pedagogy, technology, art, and contemplative studies, their training programs. And then there's also this question of doing this as a first person method in the narrow sense. So a microphonological interview is typically done with two persons. You have a trained expert, a person trained in the method, uh, guiding persons who aren't trained. And it is possible to kind of interview yourself using the same techniques. So that's what I've been working on also in recent years. And this is the kind of the end, uh, final study, just outlining that whole uh, method, microphonological self-inquiry. So the researchers studying their own experience. Uh, and there have been, yeah, well, let's do this first. So again, I think I've, I've said this. Yeah, you study your own experience. Um, you don't, for instance, need to ask yourself specific questions. You can do that, like talking out loud, but you can find that you can also just use your attentional training in a way to unpack, the, for instance, the pre-reflective uh, domains of experiences, experience. Um, but you would then talk aloud reporting on your experience. Um, and what we've shown is that this definitely uh, requires training. I'll go into that in a minute. And there are different advantages and disadvantages when it comes to this method going to focus on um, actually the last one on the left, the availability. So this is kind of a setup for studying meditation experiences. And some meditation experiences kind of happen, you know, if you're lucky. They can happen in a very specific setting. Um, and that means that as it happens, if you're a trained microphonologist, you can actually go to that experience right after it happened. So you'd have much, you'll have much more closer uh, uh, access to it. And you don't need a second person to sort of have to call them up or have them come to your retreat or wherever, you know, getting ready to do an interview whenever you have that experience. So that's kind of a, kind of the idea there. And the idea was also then to check whether we can just give people a handout and have them go through a microphonological interview without training. And this study showed that you can't do that. Uh, if you want to do a microphonological self-inquiry, you need the training. We actually re repeated the experimental setup that uh, Claire petit Manjan did, and our results were negative. So that's sort of the first uh, step in showing that um, you really need training in order to do a microphonological self-inquiry. And we show that in the next study from, oh, it was published this year, where I trained a small group of, of um, psychologist students, basically medical students, over a course of two weeks and had them report on their experiences of having a headache. And we could show in a very specific way how their reports became more uh, rich and that the results or the reports they gave rivaled other phenomenological studies using you know, other phenomenological methods uh, for describing the experience of having, having a headache. So that kind of shows that, well, microphenological self-inquiry is a viable project, but again, you need uh, training in order to do that. Um, yeah, so, okay, so I'm done with microphenology now. How's my time? You're great, take as much time as you need. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so these two studies are the ones I did when I was a visiting scholar, uh, the Modern Life Institute that was in, in Amherst, uh, I think around 2012. So these studies 
were about the whole the possibility of study meditation experiences or study experiences in altered states of consciousness and also creating uh, an account of contemplative science that includes the possibility of first person experience so this is a summary of the argument i presented in these papers so the first one investigating the depths of consciousness I basically argue against this idea that deep meditation experience is ineffable, you know, not possible to describe conceptually. The argument there draws on my, my earlier work on, on Hegel and um, the, the reply uh, or the response is that, well, some experiences might be very strange, even contradictory, um, but with um, certain kinds of dialectic, dialectical concepts, it is possible to describe what's typically understood as ineffable. You know, again, with specific forms of concepts, deep meditation experiences can be described. So it's a viable scientific project. You know, if you can't describe it, how can you study it? So that's also then kind of a setup for the, the next paper, the Nature of Contemplative Science, where I go into this question, what is science, uh, which is a very difficult one. Hardly any philosophers of science can agree on what science means in a way that includes what we typically regard uh, as science. So I draw on work by a German philosopher, Paul heunigen Hühner, and show that science can be understood as a systematization of everyday experience in nine different dimensions. I'm not going to go through them, but it is about, for instance, describing experiences or explaining experiences, um, predicting and critiquing and so on. So I just take that framework and use it to describe what contemplative science can be, what it is. And it's basically these two forms of uh, approaches where you investigate what happens in the mind while it's meditating using methods of other sciences, for instance, neuroscience. But then again, you have this other approach where you study what happens in meditation or spiritual practice in general from first person perspective, i.e. in the sense of your own experience. So then you need to ask, okay, so what kind of systematicity do you, uh, can you put on the table there? Well, microphonology. Here it is. So that's a way then of sort of transporting uh, microphenomology into contemplative science. All right. So that's the setup then for studying meditation experiences. Um, also, again, sort of I like to approach this also within more traditional setting where the whole idea of spirituality of divinity and so on is very much in the open, um, which also kind of relates to why first person methods are so important because these are mostly experiences, you know, experience of the divine. Uh, how, how, do you, like, how do you measure that? You know, well, you can see what happens in human physiology, for instance, but that ex experience isn't publicly available you know, at least most cases. So then you get this whole possible project of actually opening up that domain, spiritual experience to scientific research or contemplative science. Um, and if you go to the traditions, you get these, these uh, different pictures, frameworks of stages of meditation. A specific progression of experiences that you can go through as meditation deepens. Now, this idea has been controversial, I'd say, for many decades. Uh, but there has been a switch um, where people, some researchers, have sort of revisited that idea. And I draw a lot on uh, work by Kenneth Rose. Uh, Canadian uh, philosopher does also uh, religious studies. And this was kind of a breakthrough through a book for me, Yoga, Yoga Meditation and Mysticism, Contemplative Universals and Meditative Landmarks. And what it does is compare three meditation handbooks from the traditions, Buddhism, yoga, 
and uh, Catholicism, outlining, outlining different stages, five stages that he can pr progress through. And he also has an interesting argument for why this project is, is, is viable in a way. You know, the typical argument against it has been that you can't really isolate religious experiences, spiritual experiences from within the culture and the language that it's formulated within. And that has been, I think, the general sort of sense um, within religious studies. But then, you know, with the development of neuroscience, you can show that across traditions, there are similar things happening in human physiology and the brain and so on. Um, there's this also, there's also the argument of, well, animals probably have emotions and they don't have language. So there might be experiences sort of that are deep within our biology in a way that are not influenced by uh, the cultures that, you know, um, such experiences are interpreted within. And there's also the phenomenological argument where if you look at the handbooks, we get analogies, sometimes experiential reports, there are interesting similarities. And um, these are the five stages at the same table. I definitely won't go through all of this, but here's the, the outline. You see that on, on the left. So the first landmark is the mind focuses on a meditation object and you get mind wandering and so on. It's very familiar, I would imagine, to, to, to most of the people here. Second stage, there's a switch where the mind fixes on and locks on the meditation object. So it's basically talking about uh, concentration meditation here. Stage three, simplification, where the mind simplifies itself factor by factor. This is, the, for instance, the jhanas in Buddhism. And then there's the fourth stage where the mind is fully stilled and you go into stillness and the mind is then finally transcend, transcended in beatitude. And then you get the traditional concepts of nirvana and um, you know, a unification with the divine and so on. So that's a kind of an outline of potential experiences. And my idea was then to, okay, so, is it possible then to start to describe the second stage here? Because I'd have had this come up, you know, if I go on retreat, something happens, and it is actually like the mind is starting to lock on to the object. So here are some analogies from the traditions. Uh, this is the Universal Demaga from Buddha Gosa. What happens in Dhyana? Again, the second stage here. Um, where attention is only locks in or focuses sharply on the meditation object. It's similar to how a child learns to walk. Some points it's, it's actually, you, you find balance and you manage to take a few steps. And in Patanjali, there's this anal analogy of oil flowing from one pot into another. And in the beginning it drips, so there's no continuity. But at a specific point, there's a stream. So there's a continuity that develops. Mine is fully on the object. And you get this in the, the, the Catholic meditation manual also of Pola, um, where there's a comp uh, an analogy of, uh, of a compass, which doesn't really move if there's a little bit of wind, but yeah, if there's a lot of wind, if there's a storm, uh, the magnet or the, the compass moves. But once the wind is over, it goes back by itself to where it was pointing. So like reading descriptions like this, it's pretty easy to get a sense that um, people are possibly talking about the same thing. So the idea then for a study was to build an open access to the state and then do microphenomology repeatedly on what happened before, during and after that state. So I did this a while back on a retreat, uh, went for about a week, it takes a few days to build up the state, but then, you know, it appears and then I start doing microphonology and I trans transcribe and anal analyze the experiences, you know, from day to day. And then there's a possibility of a fourth step also where you check the analysis in relation to the experience. You go into Diana again and again and again, and you check whether your descriptions are consistent, whether it's a variety there, maybe, you know, and whether at one point you read saturation where you kind of covered all of the categories. And that resulted in this summary, basically, of as a kind of a microphenomological recreation of the second stage 
of dhyana um, or access concentration um, with the Buddhist terminology. I'm not going to go through the details here, but if you, if you go to the bold font, that's where I speak about like a magnet-like focus. I use the analogy of riding a bike. So in the beginning, you kind of need to steer, but at one point when you got enough speed, there's momentum and you kind of can just lean back and let the bike flow. You can even drop the steering wheel. And it's, this happens to concentration as well. Like there's something happen where you don't need to focus, but the object draws you in instead. So it's a, like in a, there's a polar switch there. Thoughts are less stiff, sticky. There's a sense of effortlessness. You don't need to use energy to focus. And there's also a new thing that I haven't seen in the manuals where there's sort of a pulling in of attention or feeling like you're being lifted up and so on. All right, so uh, yeah, final thing there. Also that I haven't really seen in the manuals. Um, there's a certain shift that happens where you can kind of start to sense that the state is about to appear and then you can consciously shift into it. And I just describe how that, that process in on a microphonological level, just try to describe this sense of, I'm ready now to switch into this effortless concentration, or sometimes it just grows by itself. So I can sort of just give different descriptions of how a state arises. All right, so I'm getting into the final part now, which is research on challenging meditation effects. So I'm sure a lot of people has already heard about this. Um, you know, meditation research has been focused on meditation benefits. And it seems like uh, some people, maybe a lot of people experience challenges. So here's a study done by Michael Schlosser that I was also um, um, an author on. And here we found that about 25% of regular meditators have had a very unpleasant experience in a psychological sense. You know, for instance, fear coming up in meditation. So it seems to be quite prevalent. And of course, there's this question about what does this mean? Does this mean, as some would say, this is a news report on this study, meditation retreats bad for your mental health study suggests. So we show that like challenging experiences tend also to happen more on, on retreats. But this is definitely not the way we put it in the article. Just showing that things can be challenging doesn't mean that it's bad for your mental health. But of course, there is this question about what does this mean? You know, are there certain experiences that can be harmful in a way? At one point, can you have growth related experiences um, in relation to those challenges? I think that's an experience that many people has, have also had. Meditation can be challenging, but if you meet that challenge, that's where growth happens. So that's definitely a sort of a continuing research interest that I've had. And I've also done one first first person study on this. Uh, this one, Fair Bliss and Breathing Changes during Meditation, okay, strategy of a transformative experience. So mm, this relates to a certain experience that I'd had basically for the last 20 years that uh, breathing can change during meditation, it can even stop. And for me, that became very unpleasant, psychologically very challenging. Anxiety came up, even um, developed into um, panic attacks. So first thing I want to show that uh, this is, or might be prevalent, there's a pretty influential study here by, by Lindahl and colleagues. They tried to map out different uh, forms of challenging experience experiences. This is only uh, done with 60 participants, but you can find breathing changes here as well. I think it's, um, I can't see it. Uh, yeah, it's there, it's, it's, it's in a somatic column. And they found that 27% had had breathing changes, which is altered respiration rates that may manifest as temporary cessation or speeding up or slowing down of breathing. This can also be breathing irregularity and it can be unpleasant. It can be very unpleasant. 
The thing is that these experiences are also described in the traditions. There is um, one from, uh, from uh, the suttas, where in the fourth jhana, breathing, at least as an experience, has ceased, you know, pretty radical. And you'll find this also in different meditation manuals uh, described by different meditation teachers. Some say it feels like breath has stopped. Um, and some say it has really stopped, you know, which phys physiologically, at least for a prolonged period of time, shouldn't be possible. And um, again, for me, that was extremely unpleasant when that started. And I figured out this case. So I'm going to try to study this, figure out what is going on here. And there was definitely this sense of suffocation happening as well. So, you know, research question, is this, you know, a psychological phenomenon or is it, uh, does it have a, a physiological correlate? So what I did, this is all just showing that there has been some, some studies uh, showing that breathing uh, changes, particularly cessation also happens. Um, but back to the study I did. So I just took diary notes that I've done over many, many years about meditation experiences and did microphonology on the breath cessation events. And then I also did pulse, oxy pulse oximeter measurements, which just, you know, is a quick and easy way of showing uh, how, you know, the, the blood, uh, the oxygen saturation is in the blood. And the diary notes, yeah, I find episodes where I just describe that, you know, breast stops for 10 to 20 seconds. And um, some of them, uh, some of the descriptions show that it also gets very, very unpleasant. I'm going to skip reading through that and just documenting what happened. And then I did an analysis later on. But interesting, what was interesting was also that the oxygen saturation in the blood did actually change during those events. So it was also a physiological uh, reaction. There was an experience of suffocation going on and the idea then you're highly concentrated. Maybe the mind starts to react against something that's very pleasant, unpleasant and then that can grow into a full-blown panic attack basically. Here you can see just some measurements. The above one is uh, oxygen saturation goes down as the pulse goes down about, about 12 minutes into the meditation. You know, for further details, you can just check the study. Here is a summary of the experiential dimensions. So the first notes I found in my diary was around 2003. This noted irregularities. And then the cessation started about 2012. And I categorized all negative experiences as either or challenging experiences, either physical distress or mental distress. So you can see that uh, basically starts from the beginning. But then I started to note also high concentration during the breath session and other positive effects like bliss or just pleasant sensations in the body. And then there's well, there was this Vipassana retreat that I did. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the detail there, but it was a very you know, specific series of events where I could go into that extremely unpleasant sensations connected to the breath sensations, which led to a kind of an energetic switch where that whole thing about the negative emotions basically just left my body. And after that, whenever there were breath sensations, the mental distress was gone. And so whenever that happened, you know, after 2016, it is a positive experience. So there you can see that like something that's very challenging for many, many, many years can switch and become something very positive. And this just shows that like to do contemplative science, you need to do studies over many, many years. And if you do a study like a short amount of time, you really can't capture these kinds of, of transformations. All right, and this became a setup for what I call a comprehensive first person phenological method, consisting of three domains of experience where you have sort of the biographical narrative dimension of experience. That's the macro phenological domain. And then you have the meso phenological domain, which is just day-to-day -day experience, diary notes and so on. And then you have the micro phenological domain. 
And a comprehensive um, approach would include all of these. So as I did, you know, with a breath cessation, I just went into all the different notes I'd done throughout the years, figured out what this means to me and start to go into the details of the experience and then relate that back to um, the personal dimensions, the day-to-day -day dimensions and so on. And um, the idea is of course then to develop this further into um, basically a group um, group retreat studies where people train in these methods do retreat together on specific topics and there are interesting things you can do there when you work with other people as well so this is a study that i did with some students in germany so we had this idea of tracking how hindrances meditation hindrances develop and when or how you have breakthroughs which means for instance that a hindrance go, goes away so what we did was that we did like an initial and final interview, a semi-structured interview, about what this whole project means to you and so on. So you get sort of the biographical data, the macro phenomenological data, and then you do a regular retreat schedule, you know, go deeper and deeper into meditation over days. And we had group evening conversations, sharing experiences and recorded all of, the, all of these. And then we did individual journal, journaling. Some people had different research questions and so on. And then whenever something interesting happened, like a specific hindrance came up, or you had a specific breakthrough, you could do a microphonological interview right away, either by yourself or with one of your colleagues or friends. And um, yeah, so we get a whole lot of data on this. Uh, nothing of that is published except in, I think, three or four bachelor theses. Um, hopefully that will come out soon. Um, yeah, so this is basically just how it how it would look. You have the first interview, the final interview, you have journaling every day, group conversations every day. And if you have a hindrance of one kind, you studied that on one day, another one microphenomenologically on a second day, and then maybe even on the breakthrough and, and so on. Um, and yeah, again, the data isn't out yet, but the the conceptual setup for it is out. This is, I think, my, my most recent paper discussing the ideas of, of um, meditation hindrance, what, does, what that means. You know, bringing meditation research again back to sort of the spiritual origin. Uh, challenging experiences isn't something uh, very sort of unusual. Challenges are sort of built into the process, uh, I'd argue, from, from the beginning. Um, but there are also different strategies that you can use for approaching the hindrances. And I'm trying to just set up a conceptual framework for that before uh, interpreting first-person experiences as well. So almost done now. Uh, another thing that has to be done in order to make this more systematic is actually to agree about what a meditation is. So you want to study specific meditation techniques do that in a group setting, sharing, comparing experiences. Uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's going to be comparable, again, you need to agree that you're doing the same thing. So this is a paper just trying to give an overview of all potential meditation techniques on the level of an activity, something you do. For instance, focusing, or releasing, or observing, or being aware, and so on. And. Uh, that is also uh, actually a setup for what I think might be the next step in first person research where you go into uh, causal dimensions. This is a controversial topic. Some would say that phenomenological methods are mostly about interpreting experiences, not explaining them. This is from another talk. You can find that in YouTube, YouTube where I'm, I'm trying to make that argument that first person methods can also be used to um, um, figure out what's sort of going on in the background so you can get causal explanations also from the first person perspective and yeah final slide this is what I'm going into now uh, what I'm focusing on is called the adept phenomenology study where um, I study with a team of researchers uh, Matthew Saket at 
the meditation research program, such as a general hospital, Harvard Medical School, so neuroscientists, and they have um, very, you know, well developed uh, measuring capacity, you know, whole uh, neuroscience labs set up. And we're going to then uh, investigate meditation experts going into the jhanas, going through stages of insights, having awakening experiences. Um, and I do interviews with them about their experience, but also do these kinds of practices. And just to give an example, uh, um, what I get from then doing first person microphenology on the jhanas influence how we develop the questionnaires that we use in, in neuroimaging. Um, yeah, so there we come back to where I started basically, um, because again, this is kind of controversial in the sense that people are talking about awakening experiences, which I think is both, you know, a difficult topic, but also necessary in order to advance contemplative science. And at least, you know, uh, this group meditation research setting that I just described, I think is a good place to start. It's kind of somehow contained. Um, and you can, you know, discuss whatever you want to share and whatnot and so on. So, yeah, um, I think I'm going to end there. And if there's, uh, you know, anything you want to ask about, that's, that's what we're going to do now. Should I st stop sharing my screen, perhaps? Sure, that'd be great. And what's the time? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is perfect. We've got just about a half an hour for discussion mm -hmm. and questions. So um, feel free, if you have questions or comments, you can post them in the chat, or um, you can also um, just raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, apologies, I think my internet was a bit unstable. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to post them in the chat um, or feel free just to raise your hand right off the bat. And I see um, Bruce Bao. Um, do you want to unmute yourself? And share your comment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor, for an absolutely fascinating uh, talk uh, in a hugely important research area uh, with incredible attention to detail. Um, I, 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 two, uh, two things, really. I, I have a comment just on at the end of uh, uh, the research that you're doing uh, with Harvard, uh, looking at possible uh, underlying causal relations. And uh, I, I, I think it's remarkable that after a hundred years, you should be returning to William James' uh, work on that, uh, which of course he produced from Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, everything goes full circle. Um, the other, uh, I, I wanted to share with you an experience I had, or I have had using uh, microphenomenology uh, from which I, I, I had training from Claire, and I used it on a non-dual experience, uh, which uh, until then I had been describing uh, in terms of what I felt was the experience. When I actually used the microphenomenology, I realized that during the experience, there were no reference points. There, there was nothing to conceptualize. The conceptualization only began after the ego was being reconstructed. Now, it was being re reconstructed in the terms of the um, particular system that I had used to reach that. And um, you were talking earlier about before, during and after. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, I had been going straight from the before to the after within the uh, particular uh, system that I was using. Uh, and it was only when I actually um, went right back, right back, right back uh, on the after did I realize that actually in the, at the moment of non-duality, uh, there were no reference points and therefore nothing to conceptualize and the conceptualization only came afterwards. So uh, just an experience that you might find interesting. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh, 
that also kind of goes to uh, a deep issue I was touching on a little bit when it comes to you know the possibility of of conceptualizing spiritual experience. Uh, that, that's that's a deep topic. Um, um, some would say, for instance, that an, an awakening experience basically consists of a cessation where experience completely goes away, meaning that you can't actually do research on that experience because it isn't an experience, you know. Um, but that that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big topic. Well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you once again. Yeah. Okay, we have another hand up. Um... Shonak, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, please correct that's, me. That's fine. That's good. Um, thank you so much. Of course, uh, very important work. Uh, unfortunately, my question actually starts where you just finished, which was kind of the question about maintaining uh, continuity of experience. So um, I don't, you don't need to, hold on, I want to drop a some quotes in the chat quickly, but you don't need to read these. We mm -hmm. can just skip them. Is it just kind of, okay, I can't do it. It doesn't really matter. So being familiar with anthroposophy, um, Rudolf Steiner made a lot of comments concerning intellectualism. Um, and in my experience, intellectualism does not usually dry, jive with imaginal experience. Mm. And the reason is because it's past oriented mm -hmm. to a great degree, among other reasons. And academia has a very strong bias towards intellectualism. And so the analogy I often think of is like, right now, uh, it might be poor analogy for some people, but right now there's an argument that women are equal and they can do whatever they want. but the, the whole playing field is patriarchal and it, it's almost a joke, right? Because the value system's like that. So I experience a certain almost violence when I have to reflect intellectually mm -hmm. and I consider it almost to be a hindrance mm -hmm. towards working with transpersonal and or imaginal realms. Mm -hmm. And you made a comment earlier about trying to work in a spiritual setting mm -hmm. sometimes. So I, I know you're aware of this. Um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot because it's a tough spot, but you're probably uniquely qualified to make a comment here. So I just, if you have any thoughts to share. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is an important topic. And I mean, I, I didn't mention it, but it, it's definitely the case that it is challenging to do research on your own meditation experience because those gestures are kind of opposite and just the whole idea of going into like a systematic microphilological uh, study on let's say surrender you know uh, not easy uh, and there's you know things going on let's say on sort of an emotional soul level when you're doing this kind of research as well where you sense that uh, this isn't the moment, you know, to like poke and try to pull apart whatever is going on here. Uh, and that's kind of also actually the beginning of a microphonological interview where you feel into where, I'm, where am I now? Am I ready to actually like uh, dissect this experience? But I find that it is, it is possible. It can be a bit tiresome, you know, um, and to a certain extent, they all are also, uh, uh, well, to put it like this, if you do research on meditation experience, you take quite a lot of meditation energy out of your meditation. So it is costly. It is costly. But I think like the payoff, at least, you know, there, there's some worth in it. Um, but it is also like definitely a day-to-day -day question. And uh, um yeah, I think it, it's possible to 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 do both. You know, uh, it's this whole idea of being, uh, uh, you know, an academic that's also a pra practitioner. And sometimes, you know, what you call violence. You know, I find like making distinctions, um, like this or not like that. That there's some value in that too. Uh, that can actually go back into practice. You know. Um, 
are there more effective ways of practicing? This is what I find also within uh, some meditation communities where people actually share and discuss experiences that can take a lot of, um, let's say, I don't know, like mystique or it, 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 it uh, kind of kills the experience a little bit, but it can also be very helpful. So I, I guess that's that's kind of the, the thing I want to say. Yes, intellectualism, the research perspective can kill <laughs> some of your meditation efforts, but there is also kind of resurrection coming out of it. That's absolutely uh, valuable. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that great question. So we still have about 15 minutes for more questions, sharing if you'd like. Yeah, Hamdan, do you wanna step in? You can unmute yourself if you're able to yes. ask a question. So first of all, thank you for this great presentation. I learned a lot on new things. Um, and at the same time, I was thinking, especially regarding your quotes also that you uh, used, um, that came from Buddhist, various Buddhist traditions, right? I was just wondering, because I'm not uh, so familiar with the Buddhist uh, literature, whether something like microphenomenology was not already going on, um, like, I don't know, in this long tradition. Hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, I'd say you pretty much go into the same domain of experience, but um, with different aims. So in a Buddhist, con Buddhist context, it would be with absolute or, or the, the final aim of, of enlightenment or awakening, uh, deconstructing experience, maybe finding the truth in a sense, but, uh, you know, in the sense then of the Four Noble Truths or something, how suffering ends, that's what you're looking for. Uh, and the research perspective, yes, it can include that, but... <laughs> actually goes back to the last last question. Um, is it sort of possible to take a step back and just describe experiences as they are, you know, from a disinterested point of view? Um, I mean, why would you do that? So of course I have some interest also in the, in the, in the background here and that's basically related to, you know, the platonic or anthroposophic perspective of there is something going on behind the curtain that it's essential to discover. That's kind of a you know, fundamental spiritual idea. Um, and also that there's some value in this disinterested stance, just describe things as they are. Um, probably you could get more effective Buddhist practice also just doing microphenomenology. Um, if you're trained in Buddhist practice, I think the chances are pretty high that you're a better microphenomenologist. Um, but this is this is kind of kind of going into a different direction as well. Something I haven't like developed my thoughts fully on is the idea of to what extent um, you construct experience based on how you approach it. So if I take the stance that um, what I'm most interested in is the end of suffering, I might look at experiences in a specific way. Um, based on that, let's say, pragmatic perspective. If I take a different pragmatic perspective, maybe something else comes out. So I'm not sure sort of when, where the construction ends, whether it's possible to set that fully aside and sort of where absolute reality appears, you know, unhindered, uh, still very much open questions for me. Yeah. I was just intending the question more along the lines of uh, like what Bruce uh, Bo just uh, replied, inevitably the seeing is the doing, like uh, whether whether in the Buddhist tradition, uh, whether it's not already sort of a, a foundation to see practice and the, and the knowledge that appears as a consequence. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it hasn't really uh, been separate yet, you know, within that uh, setting. Uh, there is the idea of, of knowledge uh, very much in the center. You know, knowledge is liberating. But um, it's also always, it has this pragmatic view of the end of suffering. Uh, that's the context where it's in, you know. And there are, there are other ways of, of, of viewing experience. That would be like, you could go to anthroposophy and ask, so how about, like, is it possible to relate differently to impermanence? 
So that would be like a typical Steiner saying that, yes, uh, the, the, the world of phenomena is impermanent, but there's something that shows itself through uh, the coming and going of, of phenomena that's not like relative or something like that. Um, yeah. And I mean, this this tangling or, or just distinction between knowledge in a scientific sense of disinterested study on the one hand and like doing something good that has happened specifically within sort of our scientific uh, setting. And there is, I'm not sure I would call it damage that has happened through that, but there's at least for me, something that's not satisfactory. Um, but I wouldn't be ready to, to like take any spiritual setting or tradition and have that being sort of the foundation of how I want to do knowledge practice. So there's something valuable about doing knowledge practice for itself also that I want to, I don't know, champion, defend. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from Nicola in the chat. She asked us to read it out. Um, so she said, can Terya tell us more about the goals and methods of anthroposophical meditation? Hmm. Well, big topic. Um, so let's see if I can, can summarize that. So was it the goals and methods or just was it the goals? goals? Yeah, goals and methods. Goals and methods. So there, there are hundreds of meditation techniques, uh, very hard to, to, to summarize. Um, but <clears throat> let's see. So there is this worldview, I guess you could call it, that the human being has been separated from the source. And this is, in a sense, a good thing. This is a condition for freedom, separating from where you come from. And this has a ne negative side as well, where, you know, life becomes empty, meaningless, you don't have a direction. Um, and the idea then is that you can, through different form of meditation techniques, reconnect to the source, spiritual world. And as I said in the beginning, that will open up uh, ways of also relating differently to nature, um, social environment, human beings, and so on. Now, the one way of presenting the general structure of the techniques is that you do different form of concentration practices using mantras or different meditation objects. And um, that sort of opens you, or first of all, it disentangles you from your normal perception. You kind of make your own kingdom, you know, you become the king of your attention. And then once attention is disentangled from the physical world through emptying consciousness and opening your heart in a way, you know, um, with a loving gesture, you can get different forms of information, perception coming in through uh, spiritual organs. So Steiner has this whole system of how you can open up different chakras and use them as ways of perceiving spiritual world, different energies, spiritual beings, karma, and all of that. It's a very big, complex, complex system. Um, but yeah, I think I've outlined it, outlined it there pretty much. Hope that was satisfactory. I'm not sure if Nicola can unmute herself, but um, if you want to add anything, Nicola, feel free to in the chat. Yes. Yeah. First of all, to say congratulations, Hirsch. You're right on the money. You're doing exactly what needs to be done. And please keep going. Um, the other thing is about intellectual intellectuality. I mean, I suppose you could say that the Buddhist suttas, especially in Theravada Buddhism, are a kind of listing and science approach. Um, and and I believe in the, I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the school. You muted yourself there. There was a school in about the third century AD, um, which sounds quite like uh, phenomenology. Um, there, is, there is a book book about it actually, but I'm afraid I haven't can't tell you about it. But but uh, 
in other words, there is an antecedents for mm. um, combining thinking about it with uh, uh, doing it. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that comment. Thank you. Um, we do have, um, looks like we have a couple more questions, one of which is anonymous. So I'll just read that out anonymously. And then we have, um, I think we'll end with Wolfgang. We'll have time for just two more questions. So the first question is, didn't the enlightenment cause a break with the Greeks related to the quote unquote hidden, whereas there's not such a break occurring in the East? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a whole new lecture. Um, <laughs> Did it happen in the East? Didn't it happen? Um, so I think if you do the, the Western perspective there, yes, there's been an enlightenment. There's been a kind of severing of human consciousness and the world and so on that wasn't really that present with the Greeks. But um, there's been an undercurrent in the European tradition, you know, the esoteric or even occult understream uh, of the European culture, uh, you know, you get all these stories about witches and magicians and, and whatnot, um, Freemasons, Ros Rosicrucians, um, Christian mystics and all of that, that haven't really, you know, they rep represent something else, but have also kind of been outcasts uh, throughout 2000 years in a sense. And, and there possibly kind of goes back to, or is part of that moment still. Some would say it's, you know, it hasn't gone through a form of secularization and maybe that's true, but there's something something beneficial to that as well. You know, kind of natural romanticism. There is a basic connection between things and that is fully uncoverable. Um, but again, you know, I, I kind of enjoy or like that approach, that view. But what's funny is that I'd had to go to Eastern traditions to really find people who are competent in those practices um, and like doing that, you know, developing capacity for, for jhanas and so on. I think that's the only way to actually, you know, re-enliven re that undercurrent uh, that anthroposophy uh, represents and continues in a way. But that's also like a future, future project. That's a vast, that's a vast question. Thank you for the question and for the, for the response. Wonderful question. Yeah. Great question. So uh, Wolfgang, I don't know if you're in the position to unmute yourself. Would you like to ask your question directly? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Hi, Terry. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful uh, talk and discussion. I would like to ask you, um, there was one point that you made in, on one slide about what is contemplative science. And I thought if one tries to turn this around, it could respond to the challenge that has been brought up uh, in also previous questions about uh, the intellectual grip vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. the even primacy perhaps of the meditative or contemplative or, or imaginal experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you restate one of the uh, sentences that you had as investigating methods of science with the meditative mind, mm -hmm. as it were, um, coming first from um, being firmly mm -hmm. like deeply rooted in the contemplative experience with that um, mm -hmm re i don't know reappraise if you will mm -hmm. and take up the the tools of uh, intellectual analysis such as microphenomenology and then do the analysis on your experience um mm -hmm. and maybe i wonder if that could help uh, or if you have any experiences with that uh from your own experience or, or the research that you've done like it's coming and, from yes and, uh, and lastly, also, yeah. whether this has something to do with the point you made in the beginning about anthroposophy, um, often the spiritual dimensions being left out and you kind mm -hmm. of just go to the intellectual or rational um, elements of it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So just to just to check. So the, the first question was about this idea of uh, coming to, to science, scientific methods from the meditating mind as sort of a starting point. Yeah. Um, mm. 
If I try that, I mean, in a way, it's hard to separate. If I like answer it biographically, I think meditation came into my life first. So in a sense, that's where I start. Um, but there's there's also a specific connection between the two, I think. Scientific approach, meditative approach. Um, if you just take like ideal of science, truth, unify with truth. So it's a way to describe meditation. So these they don't need to be like considered as something distinct. And for me, that's the whole beauty I find actually in the, in the Platonic tradition, where whatever you do with your mind, with your thinking, is related to you know the unity of everything. Uh, so there's there are different ways of conceiving thinking, not only as intellectualism or creating abstract pictures of something outside of experience. Um, contemplation goes back to the Greek word of uh, theoria, you know, which is our word theory, which basically is a way of, of, I think the literal translation is something like watching the gods, the activity of the gods, or, or seeing the divine. So I'd say that this is, this is where science come from originally, if we go back to the Greeks. It wasn't really separate initially, but there's something that needs to happen in order to bring the two like, back together. Um, yeah, so like what meditation does is in a way to realize truth as science is seeking it, you know, but there's also definite value in trying to describe things, you know, using words and concepts. Communication is, is dependent upon it and getting precise and even reliable because that's also a definite challenge. Um, it can get really messy when you try to talk about awakening experiences, for instance, try to get a consensus about that. It's really difficult. Um, and, you know, now we have approaches, um, microphonology, different phonological methods. People tend to be more open about sharing experiences. And um, I think settings are developed where that research can also proceed. Yeah. So I yeah, you had the question about the anthroposophy as well, I think. So again, I think it's pretty much what I said earlier, that it, it re represents uh, a way of approaching the world, human consciousness, the mind, nature, where this, this split really hasn't taken place, or you see a value even in intellectualism uh, as a foundation of, of freedom, but yeah, there's also like a shadow side to that that can really only be like um, amended through experiences of unity or expanding consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully Thank that you. answers Very good answer. yeah, <laughs> questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to end there. Um, I think this discussion could go on for a whole nother talk series or a whole nother, a whole nother evening. So thank you so much, Terya, for this really rich, um, what felt like a field guide yeah. uh, to the different ways of approaching um, the study of first person experience. And thanks very much for sharing your own research and also your own personal um, investment in this in this particular experiential research. So thank you so much once again, and thanks to everyone for joining us um, in the Zoom room and on YouTube. And um, just to follow suit with this, we wanted to just share about the upcoming three EVA alumni talk series um, speakers. So on October 20th, um, we'll have uh, Josipa Mihik, um, towards a caring and mindful schools model. She'll be having a, um, a different uh, approach. And um, this date is actually maybe changed at a certain point. So stay tuned, we'll announce this. But in any case, we'll have these three speakers coming up. That'll be followed by Michelle Carr. And she'll be giving a talk on dream work and dream yoga. And um, that'll be on November 17th, also at 6 p.m. Central European time. And then finally in December, we'll have Nina Volbert, who will be talking about her studies of yoga for depression, the effects and potential working mechanisms. That'll be on December 8th at 6 p.m. So these are all public talks um, once again. So you're welcome to join us for these as well and um, spread the word if you know of other friends and colleagues who might be interested. Have a really good, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks you everyone as well. Good to see you all. Thank you.